Hello class, this is section 3.8 and we are going to go through an eigenvalue problem example. And this is in fact the same problem that we introduced in the first couple of videos. But this time we are going to try to find all the eigenvalues. It's important here that we have to tackle the case where lambda is positive, negative or zero separately. Again, recall that an eigenvalue is precisely when the problem has infinitely many solutions. Let's first handle the lambda equals zero case and see if zero is an eigenvalue. So we need to see if uh, this equation has infinitely many solutions. So we have y double prime equals zero and it's pretty easy to see that the only functions whose second derivative is zero are going to be the functions ax plus b. And we have two constants, so we know that this is enough. So this is our general solution. And let's plug in our uh, initial conditions. When y equals 0, x equals 0. So this means b equals 0. And when x equals pi, y equals 0. So this means that 0 equals a pi plus b. But we know that b is equal to 0. So a pi is equal to 0, and hence a is equal to 0. And we only have one solution, but this implies that lambda equals 0 is not an eigenvalue. All right, that was easy enough. Next, let's handle the case where y is negative. So let's write lambda equals to minus alpha squared for some alpha. I'm going to handle this problem a little differently than the way the book does it because I don't really want to deal with uh, hyperbolic signs and hyperbolic cosines, but if you are familiar with that, that way is a little bit faster. So you can look at the book if you want to see a slightly different way to solve this section of the problem. So we have lambda negative and lambda equals uh, minus alpha squared, so we can rewrite our equation as y double prime minus alpha squared y equals zero. and the same initial conditions, of course. So we make our usual substitution here. And this gets us r squared minus alpha squared equals 0. So r squared is equal to alpha squared. This implies that r is going to be plus minus alpha. This is a real root. So our general solution is just going to be c1 e alpha x plus c2 e minus alpha x. So let's plug in our initial conditions and see what our endpoint conditions and see what happens. And we have 0 equals to c1 plus c2 and also 0 equals c1 e alpha pi plus c2 e minus alpha pi. So let's see what we can do about this. So the first, firstly, 0 equals c1 plus c2 implies that c2 is just going to be negative c1. So you can plug that in the second equation to get c0 equals c1 e alpha pi minus c1 e minus alpha pi. But this simplifies to c1 e alpha alpha pi minus e minus alpha pi equals zero. So the question is, when is e alpha pi minus e minus alpha pi zero? We can see what happens when that's true. So e alpha pi is equal to e minus alpha pi, or e two alpha pi equals one, taking the logs of both sides, we can just get that 2 alpha pi is equal to log 1 equals 0. And this happens only when alpha equals 0. But this is impossible because if alpha equals 0, then lambda is not going to be negative. So this is impossible. So we know that this expression is never zero. 
which implies that c1 must equal 0. So c1 equals 0, and 0 equals c1 plus c2. So c2 equals 0. And again, y equals 0 is the only solution. And this implies that lambda has no negative eigenvalues. So for no negative number lambda in the original problem, will we have infinitely many solutions. So all that remains is to check the case where lambda is positive. Let's do that. And in this case, we have our equation. And again, we can make our substitution with r equals root of lambda times i. And this implies that y is going to have a general solution, c1 cosine lambda x plus c2 sine lambda x. Let's plug in the initial condition, the endpoint conditions and see what happens. So y0 equals 0 implies that 0 equals c1, and y pi equals 0 implies that 0 equals c1 cosine lambda pi plus c2 sine root of lambda pi. Again, c1 is equal to 0, so we can just like, ignore this part. So we need to look at solutions of the form. So we need to find out c2 sine lambda pi equals 0. And we ask a similar question again. When is sine lambda pi equals 0? Because if this expression is equal to 0, then c2 is a solution for any constant c2. And we can answer this pretty easily. The sine function is 0 whenever the argument is a multiple of pi. So this is true when root of lambda is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, whatever. All for all these values, sine root of lambda pi is equal to 0. And this is true when lambda is 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, and so on. So for these values, for lambda equals n squared for n integer, we'll have sine of root lambda pi equals 0, and c2, then the only equation we have is c1 equals 0. For these lambda, the general solution is just going to be y equals c2 sine root of lambda x. This is our, from our general solution up here. c1 is equal to 0, and c2 can be anything. And this solution is going to be true for any c2. So our eigenvalues for the problem are basically these ones.